uh, welcome everyone uh, welcome back to another guest speaker session from innovate astro solutions today i'm uh, very happy to have alan anand today uh, to talk on the topic love marriage and uh, sexuality in us jyotish so to give a little bit background about alan uh, alan is graduate in uh, mathematics and physics uh, he is also graduate in diploma uh, in american college of vedic astrology he was also the former teacher of uh, uh, british faculty in of astrological studies so anand is a full time astrologer uh, writer teacher and a frequent lecturer at the jyotish conference uh, he wrote several books including uh, parivartana yoga uh, kala sharpa kama yoga and uh, some uh, few books on stellar astrology and a few more on uh, western sidereal astrology one of the interesting aspect of his writing is he wrote a uh, few novels uh, like uh, uh, what do you call uh, mystery, mystery novels yes yes mystery novels uh, with the featuring astrologer as a protagonist so that is very interesting actually so in case if you are like a uh, um, lover of uh, sherlock holmes uh, kind of stories uh, so definitely you should read allen's uh, mystery novels so you can check out his works uh, in www.navamsa.com so uh, without further delay let me welcome allen to present uh, today's topic thank you allen for accepting my invitation and uh, having your gracious presence today so let me stop sharing and uh, uh, you can take it from here yes okay uh thank you mutu for uh, inviting me to uh, speak to your group i'm honored to uh, to do this i have a great love of jyotish uh, which goes back many years um let me start with uh, just uh, an invocation and excuse my pronunciation which is imperfect but uh, just to get off in the right spirit um om sahana bhavatu sahana bunaktu sahaviryam karavavahe Tejasvina vadi tamastu avidvisha vahai om shanti 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 okay let me present my uh get my slide up here um window and boom and i'll just confirm with you do you see this slide come up marital bias mm, yeah it's started yes. coming that is there yes. uh, okay. i hope it is in the full screen mode right like uh, presentation mode uh this is in full screen yes okay fine okay thanks is that sure. good yes yeah. good good okay so um as uh, mutu said um um i've i started my education first in western astrology this is back in uh, <clears throat> the late 70s early 80s when i got my diploma from british faculty of astrological studies and for a while i was uh, for five years i was the correspondence tutor for all students in uh, in the uh, north america uh, canada um, the us and mexico um some and i practiced as a western astrologer for some 15 years and at one point uh, somebody gifted me a book on uh, vedic astrology it was actually james braha's book uh, uh, ancient hindu astrology for the modern western astrologer um i mean that's not a great book but it was a good introduction and that piqued my interest and i ran around montreal uh, at the time where i was living and bought every book on vedic astrology i could find which was only four books uh and then i went to a conference given by um the american college of vedic astrologers in in san diego the next year <clears throat> and i came home with a suitcase full of books and software um but at that conference somebody said oh you're canadian you must know hart defoe and i said no i never heard of him who is he well they said he's, he's not here at this conference but he's a brilliant teacher uh an incredible uh you know consultant he really knows his jyotish you know classically you should look him up so when i got back to uh, montreal i did uh, ask around and i found that he was living in toronto uh and um i petitioned him to um for a consultation and he said no um, um i'm not seeing people um basically he was just dealing with you know the equivalent of maharajas at that point and not seeing normal clients anymore but i persisted i said you know i'm on the verge of changing from being a western astrologer to a vedic astrologer uh, i want a consultation so that um i can uh, you know see how this works so he relented and uh, <clears throat> i went for a consultation with him it was very good uh and i said you know if you ever teach uh, i'm happy to attend and so a few months later uh 
I got an email saying he was giving a weekend course on, you know, compatibility, synastry. Um, so I went for that and I was impressed with him as a teacher. Uh, and I said, I'll, 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 I'll study more. I'll, I'll take more courses if something comes up. So it was almost a year later when I got an email and saying uh, he was starting a program, a trilogy of courses, uh, six week courses, three six week courses, what he referred to as foundation, intermediate and advanced courses, which he was at that point living in Albuquerque, New Mexico and giving his courses from uh, the um, Ayurvedic uh, Institute, which is run by Dr. Ladd, who is, you know, a, a rather a famous uh, Ayurvedan in, in North America. So I, I began my studies uh, in that program. And then after that, uh, you know, that was in 1999, 2000, 2001. And after that, he relocated to um, San Francisco Bay Area and then was uh, giving many other courses, uh, most of which I attended. He gave courses, many courses on Jyotish, but also on Hasta, also on Vastu and uh, any number of other sort of interrelated topics. So uh, over the course of, you know, 15 years or so, I studied a lot with him. My, my great fortune is that he lives here in Toronto um, now. He's back from the U.S. and I get to see him, you know, on a semi-regular basis. Um, so um, I, I thank him primarily for, you know, being where I am today, whether it's the honor of speaking to you or whether it's just having a practice in Jyotish, which I think is so far more superior to Western astrology that I, I, I never look at Western astrology anymore. I never look at a tropical zodiac chart. I never, I don't care where Uranus, Neptune and Pluto are. I, when I switched over, I did it full hearted and I said, I'm going to go totally Jyotish and not, not pretend to be half of an astrologer. So I owe great gratitude to my teacher, Hart Default, and his teacher, uh, Krishan Mantri, who used to be uh, a major uh, Jyotishi uh, in Delhi. Uh, he was a contemporary and was personally acquainted with Dr. B.V. Rahman, uh, also with uh, Shishadri Iyer, uh, and also with uh, Professor uh, Krishnamurti. So he was well acquainted with all the classical Jyotish of the day and even the somewhat radical you know, teachings uh, of um, Krishnamurti and became a master in all of those. But his guru of the day uh, back in Delhi said, you must leave India, you must go to North America where you will find a student to whom you will teach Jyotish and that student will in turn spread Jyotish in the West. So somewhat reluctantly, uh, he uh, moved to uh, Canada. Uh, one of his clients was, um, you know, one of the, uh, the ambassador, Canadian ambassador to India and said, I can get you a visa for Canada. So off he went and moved to Toronto. And um, he, uh, you know, got quickly, you know, um, uh, engaged in the local Indian community where he immediately made a reputation himself as an astrologer, the like of which nobody had met before. Meanwhile, he's looking around for this student that he's supposed to find. But all the, you know, young Indian men or women who were living in Toronto that day, their parents all want them to be doctors, lawyers, or engineers. None of them want their kids to become Jyotishis. But then one day he meets my teacher and the two find each other. You know, my teacher had been, my teacher Hart DeVoe had been looking for a real guru for years himself. Finally, they found each other and then began the classic program, the, the, the sort of troika, if I can use that word, of the three-part process of guru, shishya, and shastra. And they were together on a one-on-one -on -one basis for almost 15 years until Mantriji said, okay, Hart, it's time for you to go. And uh, I will not teach anymore because you know everything that you need to know. And then Hart went on with his uh, his career. Uh, I had great fortune to be closely acquainted with Mantriji for more than a decade while he was here in Toronto as well too. Uh, for many years, I was his chauffeur for most things, was at his satsangs for seven years or more. And I have the great honor of, uh, you know, enjoying his personal uh, blessings and his encouragement to write books. I'd been a novelist before that. And he said, you know, stop writing novels, stop inventing things, write Jyotish. And I said, I, at the time, I don't think there's anything new to write. I don't, A, I don't know anything that beyond what other people know. And B, it's all been written. And he said, neither, neither are true. He said, you are a pucka, you go ahead and you do it. 
start by writing articles and then books will come. And it's true. I started writing articles for my website and then I started writing books. It's a slow process, but it's a great process because it's a learning process. Uh, here's the first of those books that are out, Party of Art and Yoga, which was actually first a thesis for my diploma at the American College of Vedic Astrology. This is a, a great reference work for anyone who already doesn't know Party of Art and Yoga. Um, you know, I deal separately with each of the 66 different yogas that can occur under sign exchange or mutual reception with examples of each. Um, a leader went on and said, what else hasn't been written about? Well, I found out Kala Sarpa. Nobody's written anything about that. In fact, many classic Jyotishis say, you know, this is nonsense. Uh, it's not really in Shastra. Well, that's because it is not part of a written tradition. It's more a part of a South Indian tradition, which is more concerned with an oral tradition, word of mouth and, and teaching by personal contact rather than publication, which is more the norm of Northern India. Uh, and so I did a lot of research and I spent a year and a half probably uh, writing this book. And now it's, you know, a very good reference book for certainly for everything you want to know about Rahu and Ketu, but specifically about Kalasarva. And I have 36 case studies there. Uh, then I went on and <clears throat> tackled this book, which took me almost two years to do. And basically, you know, the idea of being, well, what, you know, what what is one thing that everybody is interested in? And that's relationships. I always tell my own students, you know, um, if you can simply master, well, maybe not master, but be very competent in the topics of um, analyzing and giving advice on matters of relationships and career, you will satisfy the needs of 90% of your clients. Uh, so it's my experience, and uh, and I believe this uh, to this day that <clears throat> these are the reasons why people typically come to see you for relationships and or career. Yes, there are other concerns, but those tend to be sidebar interests. Uh, so this was um, <clears throat> a work of love, uh, quite literally and figuratively as well. Uh, it's my latest book. It was just out a few months ago. Um, okay, so I want to get into our topic today. So uh, it, the topic is about marital bias. Uh, you know, this portion of this talk, uh, I, I can't get into everything that is covered in that book. You know, basically why? Because of time. Why did God invent time? Well, so that everything could not happen all at once. So we're going to get things in, in bits and chunks. This portion, uh, this uh, lecture is about marital bias. And there's a difference between marital bias and outcome, or never mind the marital part, but just bias and outcome are two very, very different things. How many people want to be millionaires? How many people work to get the right education, the right career, invest properly, work hard, et cetera, et cetera? They have the will, they have the behaviors. Do they become millionaires? Well, not necessarily so. They might become comfortable, they might become wealthy, maybe not millionaires. Why? Because they don't have the karma for it. Likewise, in terms of marriage, <clears throat> many people want to be married. Does everyone become married? No. Some people don't want to be married. Do they become married sometimes? Yes, they do. All kinds of things happen uh, contrary to what we actually wanted. So there's a difference between bias, an inclination for something, or a desire for something, and what the actual outcome is. You know, we can sort of take a page out of uh, the Bhagavad Gita, who is, you know, one of the core teachings is that you have every right to pursue that which seems right for you, but there is no guarantee at the end of that that God will reward you for those efforts. So you put into it what you can in your belief that it's right, but then it's come what may. Um, whether you get rewarded. So when we analyze a horoscope, we're looking at actually different things when we're considering bias uh, versus outcome. When, we, when we're looking at a bias, we're looking at the, uh, it's, it comes down to graha vichara. We're analyzing the disposition of the planets. Uh, their avastas, their interrelationships with, with each other, whether they form yogas, their placement in the bhavas, all this is significant, but mostly it's the condition by Avasta of the Grahas and their interrelationships with each other that creates a psychological bias for certain behaviors and not for others. But meanwhile, let's say if it's a topic of marriage, if you want to analyze the outcome of marriage, we it becomes a bhava vichara. We are then looking at the seventh house primarily, 
There are others. If you follow Krishnamurti, there are house clusters to 7-Eleven are significant for marriage, but primarily it's the seventh house. And so we examine the seventh house, the occupants of the, of the house, the ruler of the house, where it is gone, uh, aspects of benefics versus malefics on the house. Those are all things that matter. Where, where, what is the disposition of the karaka for that specific bhava? These are all things that are part of bhava vichara, and they might indicate very different um, uh, prognosis other than what the person is striving for. So to recap, um, bias and inclination is a psychological thing, and we analyze that through the disposition of the planets. The outcome of any endeavor is really uh, down to bhava vichara, where we analyze the house, its lord, and, and its disposition. That's an important distinction to keep in mind. The bulk of this lecture is merely about the bias, not about the outcome. Now, what drives us, you know, in all this? Uh, so just a little knowledge of, you know, Vedic psychology is helpful in this regard. So we are driven in a way by samskaras, vasanas, and vrittis. So, you know, samskara is basically a byproduct, a feeling, a sensation, a residual memory that sinks into our into our psyche, you know, the karma shaya, and resides there after every experience that we've had, every thought, word, and deed in our life leaves some samskara. So over time, we accumulate all of these samskaras of different disposition. When we have multiple samskaras that sort of bind together under common themes, they form a kind of a psychological construct, which we can then call a vasana. It's a bundle of samskaras that are all related to a certain kind of experience or outcome. And it's like, uh, you know, on a, on a a very, very foggy day, <clears throat> uh, little droplets of water accumulate on a window pane. And after a while, as more condensation appears, these droplets coalesce and then a droplet runs down the window pane. That's where a samskara becomes a, um, a vasana and it achieves critical mass to then be visible and discernible. And then that, you know, uh, awareness of that and a desire creates a kind of a current in the mind, which we can call a vritti, which, um, you know, is reinforced by repetitive action uh, in pursuit of such a goal. So there's a kind of a cycle in all this, you know, kriya is the initial action. And as a consequence of that, it leaves a state, a feeling, an impression, an ubhava, and that leaves that residual memory in the karma shaya, the samskara, when those are bundled by common theme, they form a vasana or vasanas, and then that creates a desire, or if you like, it, uh, itcha or an itch, uh, something that has to be scratched in order to, um, you know, relive it again, and that leads back into uh, kriya and uh, a cycle of action, and on and on it goes. So when we come down to looking at marriage, you know, we can look at a chart and say, you know, what, what's going on here? Will a person be married and, and uh, or will they simply try to get married and not get married? Or will they not try to get married and get married? So vasanas indicate our inclination or our disinclination uh, for marriage or relationship. And we're going to analyze that through graha vichara. Whether we become married and what is the consequence of that marriage, whether it's happy or whether it's stressful or whether we uh, ended in divorce or and then whether we get back on the horse and uh, you know form another marriage, <clears throat> that's going to be indicated by our karma and the analysis of the houses. So this is that distinction between bias and outcome. Most of this lecture today is about bias. So when we talk about a person's inclination for marriage, there must be some degree of romanticism inherent. And so there are two key planets that drive uh, the individual forward in, in terms of uh, wanting and pursuing relationship. So the moon is one of those primary players. And why? Well, because it's emotionally responsive, connective. It's inherently domestic. It's nurturing. We associate it with the female, the mother. It's all these sort of warm, fuzzy qualities of, of uh, emotional content and nurture. Uh, Venus, meanwhile, is also you know, very supportive of uh, <clears throat> uh, relationship as well. Uh, because it's affectionate, uh, Venus is, is pleasure-loving and seeks to have more of the same. Venus is romantic, and basically Venus thrives in companionship. So basically, when we get the moon uh, or Venus influencing 
uh, you know, the ascendant or the ascendant lord in a horoscope, uh, the person could be said to be uh, a bit of a romantic and have something of a disposition for relationships. Uh, on the flip side, we have, uh, you know, grahas that are reluctant. Now, Mercury is considered to be disinclined for relationship because, you know, if you think of the planets as people, uh, Mercury is an adolescent, and an adolescent is too young for serious relationship. You know, they're 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 fickle, they're twitchy, they're immature. They can't commit to a relationship. They don't want to accept responsibility. They're not ready for any kind of long-term union. Uh, they're more interested in playing games. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, Saturn. If we think of it as an archetype, Saturn is an old person, an elderly, a senior citizen. Now we know the elderly and senior citizens can fall in love. So we're not taking this quite literally, but you know, Saturn is indicative of some degree of reluctance. Why? Because he's you know older, less energy, solitary by nature. You know, in terms of the solar system, it's the most distant uh, planet. Therefore, the coldest planet as well for this from the sun. And basically, Saturn lacks the warmth necessary to sustain a loving relationship. So we have the two camps now: Moon and Venus on one side. Mercury and Saturn on the other. Now, you, you could say, well, what about those other planets? Well, we, as far as this goes, this being the bias for uh, relationship, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and the nodes are considered to be neutrals. Uh, why? Well, the Sun uh, supports the status quo. Because of its regular motion, it's seen as being sort of, you know, regular, dependable, uh, uh, acting, you know, upholding respect and sort of the norm of all things. So basically it supports uh, relationship, but it's not, you know, in pursuit of it. Mars, you know, is passionate, uh, but Mars is also controlling. And so there's a bit of a tug of war there as well. Um, Mars brings passion to relationship, but it can also be combative and controlling and therefore can disturb a relationship. So we can say sort of one cancels the other out. And so we don't want to consider Mars as a primary player in, in driving uh, the bias for relationship. Jupiter, of course, is, you know, uh, Dharma Karaka and therefore the epitome of all things good and right and ethical. And we'll stand on the side of, you know, what's good for society is good for you. And again, that sort of upholds the status quo. Uh, for reasons similar to the sun, Rahu and Ketu are extremely regular in their motion. And therefore, they're also seen as supportive of marriage too. Now, some of this seems contrary, you know, because we think of Rahu and Ketu as always <clears throat> being disturbing and, and uh, or, you know, invoking foreigners or strangers. This comes into the analysis, but later in a different sort of context. So basically, we ask ourselves these questions. We can look at the horoscope from the point of view of the first house uh, and its lord or the seventh house and its lord to assess uh, the individual's disposition for marriage. So, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the self, First, independent of the moon and uh, Venus influences, if the ascendant or its lord is linked to uh, the seventh house or its lord, then there is a bias for relationship. So let's say if Lagnesh has gone to the seventh house, that's a sign for pursuit of relationships. If the seventh lord has come to the Lagna, that too is a sign for um, pursuit of relationship. If uh, Lagnesh and seventh lord are together in any house, that uh, uh, you know is an association of the two key uh, lords, one and seven, and that too will create a bias for relationship. Or if they're a mutual aspect, the same will be true. Then we consider, uh, so those are prime factors, independent of moon or Venus, but then we do look at moon and Venus under point number two. If the ascendant or its lord is linked to the moon or Venus, then that indicates something of a romantic. So if the moon is in the first house, or the moon is in the seventh house where it aspects the first, or Venus is in the first or a seventh where it influences the uh, first lord, or if Lagnesh is with the moon or Venus, or is a mutual aspect to moon or Venus. This will create the romantic. Uh, less importantly, but you know, it's still a, a background hum, uh, if uh, the Lagna is in uh, the sign of, uh, you know, in Cancer, Taurus, or Libra, which are the signs of Moon or Venus, then you will get, you know, something of a romantic disposition. Or if the Lagnesh, no matter what sign it's, uh, no matter what planet it is, 
if it is in one of those signs, Cancer, uh, Taurus, or Libra, uh, there's a bit of romanticism that comes in there too. So if the Ascendant or its Lord is in a sign of Moon or Venus, this can indicate some inclination. We do the same thing all over again from the point of view of the seventh house. We look for the seventh house. <clears throat> uh, sometimes it occupies its own house and, or aspects its own house, or it's in an exchange of Parivartna with a Graha in the seventh house. We're looking for some form of Sambanda between the seventh Lord and the seventh house or a Graha in the seventh. And that will indicate that inclination for relationship as well too. If the seventh Lord is exalted, uh, it promises something in terms of relationship. And that too can further, you know, the uh, the prospect for a pursuit of romance. If the seventh house or, or its Lord is linked to the moon or Venus by association, occupation, mutual aspect, these are all drivers of a bias for relationship as well too. Or if they're in the sign of moon or Venus, similar to what we saw with the first house. So let's look at some examples. Here's um, uh, William Butler Yeats, who was a, a poet of the uh, late 19th century, or early 20th century, actually. So <clears throat> his story was he, he he fell in love first with a woman who was a uh, you know, political activist of the day, uh, sort of a heroine of the, uh, Irish independence. He fell in love with her. He was a famous poet himself <clears throat> and sort of a bit of a catch. Uh, but she spurned him. She declined his his offer of marriage. But he was in, very intent on becoming married. Uh, and so next he turned his attention to this other woman who was also a poet. Uh, and he wooed her for a while. And she rejected him as well, too. And uh, still intent on marriage, he proposed to her daughter, who accepted, and he finally married. But he was intent on this. So if we look... Um, you know, in the horoscope, uh, what can we find that shows the uh, the the moon and uh, Venus influences on the first house or its lord? So, if we start off, we say, look, uh, this is um, a Capricorn lugna, so its lord is Saturn. So here's the lord Saturn. Um, it's in a sign of Libra, where it is exalted. And it's also in mutual aspect with Venus. So actually, <clears throat> there's a powerful sambanda going on here because Venus and Saturn are in mutual aspect. And Venus is also the dispositor of Saturn as well, too, where Saturn happens to be exalted. So this is a very strong trigger uh, with respect to romanticism. Meanwhile, um, Saturn and Mars are in mutual aspect. Uh, Mars aspects for uh, head of Saturn ten away, uh, and so there is a relationship between the first Lord uh, Saturn and the seventh house occupant Mars. You know, even though that Mars is uh, debilitated, uh, still there is a um, a tie between the two, um, a mutual aspect. Uh, Saturn and Venus sign already said that. Oh, and here we have the Moon occupies uh, Yates ascendant. And that moon, um, well, that would be a sign anyway, but as it happens, the moon is also the seventh lord. Uh, and so that is a sort of a double link there vis-a-vis -vis the moon. Uh, moon and Mars are uh, linked twice, uh, by once by mutual aspect, and uh, Mars is in the sign of moon as well, too. So we have another powerful sambanda going on there as well, too. Mutual aspect where one of the grahas is the dispositor of the other. So the Venus moon influences are substantial in this. And that's basically what we're looking for to see that powerful indication towards the pursuit of romance. Here's Lana Turner, who was a famous movie star of the... 50s and 60s in Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> and so here we have one of the dual Rashis rising, which, uh, you know, they're not warm and fuzzy towards relationship. They can be somewhat ambivalent. But let's look at our first rule and say, is there a contact between Lagnesh and the seventh Lord? Well, Lagna is a Gemini, Lagnesh is Mercury, and Mercury and Jupiter, the seventh Lord, are in uh, mutual um, aspect with each other. So immediately there is a, uh, a factor that clicks in, in ignites that notion of uh, relationship pursuit. 
Furthermore, the Mercury, Lagnesh, is with the moon. And of course, now it uh, is a mutual aspect with Jupiter. So both the first Lord and the seventh Lord are a mutual aspect, and they're both associated with and mutually aspected by the moon, which is, uh, you know, that romantic. Uh, meanwhile, Jupiter, uh, which is the seventh Lord, uh, aspects its own sign. So that's another factor in terms of, uh, you know, supporting uh, the romanticism and the pursuit of relationship. Lana Turner has a funny little quip. She said, you know, <clears throat> when I was young, my intention was to, you know, be married once and have seven children. She says, it seems I got it all wrong. I was married seven times and I only had one child. Literally true and, you know, tragic as well. Uh, Martin Scorsese, uh, famous um, movie director uh, of America, who has been married now, gosh, I'm losing track, four or perhaps five times, I think. Uh, and so what do we see in this case? Uh, so Leo rising, his Lugna is the sun. And lo and behold, right away, we see his sun is with Venus. Uh, meanwhile, his sun is in mutual aspect with his seventh Lord Saturn. Um, and now we see seventh Lord Saturn is also in mutual aspect with Venus, with whom it also has powerful Sambanda. Again, one Sambanda because of mutual aspect, second Sambanda because there, uh, Venus is the dispositor of Saturn as well too. You know, so Sambanda is something to keep an eye out for because it creates these very powerful links uh, that are more substantive than simple association and mutual aspect. Um, what else is going on here? Saturn in a Venus sign. Yes, we've covered that. Uh, Saturn, seventh Lord in the double link with Venus. Oh, uh, yes. And moon is in the seventh house, uh, which from that point, of course, it aspects the ascendant. And there's also a link between Saturn, the seventh Lord, and the moon, the occupant of the seventh. And there too, we have some banda. It's a unilateral aspect. Moon does not aspect Saturn, but Saturn aspects the moon, but Saturn also disposits the moon. So that creates a significant some banda as well there. So whenever I look at horoscopes, I mean, ever since I learned this concept a number of years ago, some banda has always been high on my agenda to you know uh, observe in any horoscope and take note of what it, it signifies, because it, it takes on greater weight than many other things. Um, now we approach the whole topic of reluctance. So, you know, from the point of view of the self, uh, is the ascendant or its Lord linked to Mercury or Saturn? So, you know, that can play out with Mercury or Saturn in, this, in the first house, or Lagnesh in association or mutual aspect with Mercury or Saturn. Um, Saturn aspecting its own ascendant. Um, then other reluctance arises for other reasons aside from Mercury or Saturn. For instance, if the individual is somewhat, let's say, weak, and they feel that they're psychologically not up to the sort of rigors of, you know, of marriage, they may be reluctant to pursue a relationship because they feel like they're getting in over their head. Well, what would indicate a weakness in such an individual? Well, if Lagnesh is debilitated, for instance, that implies, you know, literally a weakness or figuratively a weakness. What if Lagnesh is Sandi? I always think of Sandi as a, as, a, as a person walking through backyards and at one point when he has to go from one backyard to the other, he has to climb a fence. And at that point, he is neither in one yard nor the other, neither in one sign nor the other. He's very early or late in that yard. Uh, he's very vulnerable. So if uh, Lagnesh is Sandi, uh, there is some degree of uh, dysfunctionality, impairment, or at least instability and not ready for a relationship. Similarly, if Lagnesh is in a Trikishtana, it implies again some weakness. Uh, and if you get more than, you know, two of those happening at the same time, you know, the individual's really not in a, in a good state to pursue a relationship. Uh, last but not least, if the ascendant or its Lord is in a sign uh, of Mercury or Saturn, these are the least significant of factors, but still, you know, uh, can provide an additive influence to all that. We look at, you know, the perspective from the seventh house as well, too. You know, so is the seventh house 
occupied by uh, Mer or occupied or aspect by Mercury or Saturn is the seventh Lord associated with or uh, aspected uh, by Mercury or Saturn. These can all create a reluctance of some kind. And similar to what we saw with the analysis of the, the, the individual himself, the prospect for the partner, if the seventh Lord is debilitated or Sandhi, this implies, you know, a weakness in, in uh, potential partners that will not solidify into any kind of relationship. And then also if the seventh Lord is in uh, house two, six, eight or twelve, uh, that can be problematic. Now we recognize immediately if the seventh Lord is in a trikishtana, yes, that's problematic. We, we understand that. But why the second house? It's because the second house is eight away from the seventh. And therefore, it re reflects potential trauma to the relationship. And if, you know, the uh, individual parties to the relationship are not strong, such a trauma may fracture and break the relationship before it even gets started. Uh, last but not least, um, you know, seventh house or its lord is in a sign of Mercury or Saturn. Now, <clears throat> to, to uh, decline marriage, actually goes against the norm of things. Uh, you know, the norm is society wants it, your family wants it, even many individuals want to get married. Uh, if you don't want to get married, you are actually going against your family and even society's desire for you to become bonded and, uh, you know, form a stable, you know, family unit. So if a person is going to be disinclined, we need one more piece of evidence. And for that, we go to the karaka. So to say somebody is disinclined, we need more evidence. And then we go to Venus as the generic karaka for relationship. So uh, not Jupiter, <clears throat> uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman's chart you're looking to get, we're gonna use uh, Venus as the karaka. So any Venusian links by uh, occupation, uh, sorry, association or uh, mutual aspect uh, with Mercury or Saturn, that will become problematic. Similarly to what we saw with the, the, the self and the other, if Venus is debilitated or Sandy, it reflects weakness or instability. Likewise, if Venus is in 2, 6, 8, or 12, a trikishtana or the second, which is eighth from the seventh, that too will indicate a weakness in potential relationship. Uh, number four, if Venus is linked to a natural malefic other than Lagnesh, I mean, look, if it's Capricorn rising, and Saturn is linked to Venus, as we saw earlier, that's all well and good. But if it's, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Capricorn rising um, and, um, and Mars, well, that's a, that's a separate <clears throat> um, uh, malefic. It, it, actually, Mars is the worst. If you have Gemini or Virgo rising, then Mars is a trick lord, and any Venus connections with it is really problematic. Uh, last um, but not least, uh, the background hum uh, Venus in a sign of Mercury or Saturn can indicate this inclination. So now let's see some examples of that. Uh, Ludwig van Beethoven. I've kind of forgotten now what century it was in. Let's say the 17th or perhaps 18th century. Famous composer, you know, really famous, uh, you know, uh, is very much sought after in society of the day. And although, yes, he did have affairs, he did have affairs with, you know, uh, you know, uh, patrons of the day and other society women and sometimes his students and other admirers, but he never in the whole of his life became married. Well, why would that be so? Uh, so we have a look at this. And so he's got a Libra uh, uh, ascendant. I mean, and that's, you know, that background hum that say there should be some romance, but let's have a look what actually happens with Lagnesh Venus. Huh, Venus happens to be in Capricorn. And lo and behold, it is a mutual aspect with Saturn, both of which are sig significations of disinclination. Notice the sambanda here as well. One sambanda because they are a mutual aspect. Second sambanda because Saturn uh, disposes Venus. And so that is a very powerful bond then, and it means for a very substantive influence of Saturn upon Venus, which is the uh, Lord of the Lugna. Uh, and, you know, be reminded now, when we're looking at disinclination. We're going to look at first Lord, seventh Lord, and Venus as Karaka. So when we get to that third step, we're going to look at Venus again and its disposition and its um, 
powerful influence from Saturn is going to be counted twice in this case under the disinclination uh, pro forma. Uh, if we go to look at seventh Lord Mars, uh, we follow that and see where is it? Ah, it's in Gemini, which is a sign of Mercury, which is, you know, the ambivalent one, the twitchy adolescent uncommitted one. And lo and behold, it's also mutually aspected by Mercury as well. Again, note this double sambanda. Mutual aspect is one. Mercury disposes Mars as well. So there's a double influence of Mercury on the seventh lord. So on, on Lugnes, there's a double influence of Saturn. On Mars, there's a double influence of uh, Mercury. And again, this conspires against uh, relationship. Nikola Tesla, famous uh, inventor, uh, born in Croatia, was a contemporary of uh, Edison. Uh, he was the inventor of the AC electrical system. Uh, a handsome man, uh, who, after he emigrated to America in New York, uh, made a lot of money through his electrical inventions, was you know, very much uh, uh, present in high society, and every, every wealthy uh, mother wanted her daughter to marry the guy because he was you know, uh, handsome, wealthy, and famous. Uh, but he would have none of it. He said, marriage would only interfere with my work. He was in love with pigeons and his laboratory work. And that was it. Have a look at his chart, see what goes on here. Aries rising, Mars is the Lord. Mars has gone to the sixth house. Huh, Fikistana, somewhat problematic. Yes, it's with the moon, okay. But this is going to, uh, Mars is in the sign of Virgo, which is Mercury ruled. <clears throat> so that's that background hum. But it's significantly, Mars is in a Trikistana. He himself perhaps did not feel he was up to the game. Seventh Lord is Venus. And now remember, in this case, we'll be counting Venus twice. Once as the Seventh Lord, second as a Karaka. Where is Venus? It's in Gemini, the other sign of Mercury. So that's significant, and we're counting it twice. Furthermore, it is with Mercury. So there is a double sambanda there, if you like. There's association, and it's in the sign of its dispositor. So this is a huge influence towards um, um, decline, if uh, declining relationship or disinclination for relationship. It, as if we needed more evidence, there's Saturn as well. Which, you know, so the seventh Lord Venus, seventh Lord and Karaka Venus is influenced hugely by Mercury, but also by Saturn at the very same time. So <clears throat> a little surprise, perhaps, in his case. Clara Bow, um, a famous movie star of the very early Hollywood days, you know, the um, the very beginnings of the so-called talkies when people would speak in movies. Um, she had a lot of love affairs. Um, it was a had a kind of hyperactive uh, um, romantic <laughs> uh, or sexual, you know, life, I, I should say, uh, but never married. And so <clears throat> have a look at this. So she's got Aquarius rising, um, you know, and, and Saturn is there. Now, we might say that, well, that is a great disinclination. In a way, it is, yes. But when you have Lagnesh in its own sign, uh, uh, that gives it one source of strength. Retrogression gives it another source of strength, of course, because it's brighter than normal. This can give the person great charisma, and that can attract flies like honey attracts flies. And so she had no lack of people pursuing her, but she herself was personally disinclined to engage in relationship. Um, notice that Mercury occupies the seventh house, and now Saturn and Mercury are both influencing the, the um, first house and the seventh house as well. Meanwhile, the seventh Lord, um, this is Leo, so seventh Lord is the sun. It has gone to a Trikishtana, and that's problematic. Meanwhile, Venus, uh, we're only counting it once now because it didn't turn up as the Lord of the first or the seventh. We're going to look at it as a Karaka. It is in its own sign. Uh, but note here the degree of positions, 29 degrees and change. It is Sandy, therefore unstable and somewhat uh, vulnerable. Uh, interestingly, Venus and Jupiter, you know, can, can imply 
you know, quantity of, uh, of uh, relationships. And certainly she uh, had many. Uh, there was a scandal involving, uh, you know, the University of California football team at one point. Uh, but uh, <laughs> she, she never did marry. Anyway, okay, so let's, we're going to move on to uh, another topic. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm only going to get to cover some of what's included in this book, of course. But let me dive into this anyway, and we'll see how far I can get with this. Uh, love marriage, you know, perhaps is a familiar term, which indicates people who, uh, especially in, in India and other parts of the world, you know, Asia and, um, and the Middle East, whatever, where arranged marriages are common. Love marriage will indicate people who say, you know what, we, we will choose our own partners and we will go forward from there. Uh, and so um, in Western um, uh, society, this happens as well, too, where, you know, maybe families don't approve of the other person. And so the couple choose to elope, which means, you know, they basically just kind of run off and they get married on their own by justice of the peace rather than, you know, formal marriage where the families would be in attendance because there's a problem with families. So what's going on here? So the strong emotions and Mars gets involved because courage is engaged. So we're going to look at similar things, the ascendant and its Lord, and links with Moon or Mars, because the Moon, you know, sort of reflects this emotional spontaneity, or Mars has the courage to transgress, to say, you know what, I don't care what my mother and father say, I'm going to marry this woman or man or whatever. I don't care what society says. Uh, I'm going to pursue this relationship. So then if you get the ascendant or its lords with links to moon or Mars, that is going to be, you know, a driver for that passionate kind of relationship. Or if the ascendant or its lord is in the sign of moon or Mars. It's similar to what we looked at before, but now instead of moon and Venus, simply the romantic notion, we're sort of looking for more passion in the and courage to do something bold. Uh, and we do a similar thing from the seventh house. If the seventh house or its lord is linked to the moon or Mars, uh, whether by, you know, a link with the planet or in its sign. Um, and then we also look at the Karaka as well, too, in a similar kind of thing. Uh, because, again, there's a kind of a transgression going on here. And we need additional evidence to show that this will happen because it runs against the grain of what the society might have wanted. So here's some examples. Louis Armstrong, famous jazz um, uh, trumpeter of the uh, early 20th century. Uh, so right away, if you look in the horoscope here, you see Moon is in the first house. He was married like four times, basically, uh, from one you know passionate affair to another. <clears throat> um, uh, moon in the first house evokes the passion, the spontaneity. Mars in the seventh evokes you know that. Um, uh, the strong passion, those two are a mutual aspect. You know, people recognize this as a Chandra Mangala Yoga, which, you know, aside from indicating energy and enterprise, uh, can also be indicative of, you know, strong passions as well, too. You know, as it happens in this particular horoscope, uh, this Mars in the seventh house is a three-way Kuja Dosha, right? Uh, Mars in uh, one, two, four, seven, eight, or 12. From the ascendant, yes. From the moon, yes. From Venus, yes. Um, so that's perhaps why he, he was eager, well, certainly eager to marry because of the moon Mars influence, but Mars is a triple kuja dosha, why he kept having fights with his uh, partners and, you know, divorcing and remarrying again. So uh, what else? Uh, Mars uh, also aspects, the first lord is Jupiter. Uh, and so Mars aspects that Jupiter as well. So Mars aspects the first and it aspects the first Lord. Uh, Mercury is the seventh Lord. Uh, and although that can be, you know, some indication for disinclination, where is Mercury gone to? Uh, it's in a sign of cancer, uh, a minor factor, but. Um, and then Venus as a Karaka is where, uh, here Venus is in the, is in Trikishtana, yes. But it is aspected by uh, a powerful Lagnesh. So there's some connection there between First Lord and Venus the Seventh, um, Venus as Karaka. Mary Astor, again, a Hollywood star in the early days, has Scorpio rising, Mars gone to the seventh house. That's one of those signatures for the pursuit of relationship. There it joins with Karaka Venus, which is 
uh, strong. Venus in the um, in the uh, seventh is uh, can be indicative of uh, Karko Bavo Nashto, uh, which says you know things fall apart after relationship as well too. And you know some of that did happen for. Her. I think she was married twice, uh, perhaps three times, but you know constantly propelled forward into relationships. Notice that Mars aspects unilaterally the Moon. Um, Venus is in its own sign with Mars. Jupiter, uh, why do I care about Jupiter? Uh, Jupiter is linked to the first house. Uh, oh, yes, because sometimes Jupiter can be a spoiler to say, you know, Jupiter wants is to do the right thing, is it ethical and moral, uh, Dharma Karaka. Uh, and if Jupiter is dominant, it might uh, dissuade the person from doing the thing that's sort of like outrageous or against society's uh, desires. So Jupiter is a force here, but you know, Jupiter in Taurus has no strength. And so it does not have the power here to override uh, Venus, especially, and Mars, which happens to be uh, Lagnesh joined with the seventh Lord. You know, the impulse was too strong. Ethics and morals fall by the side when Jupiter is insufficient to intervene. Larry King, many people know Larry King. It was a fixture on CNN for many years, gave something like, what, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 interviews in his lifetime. Married, oh, I've lost track, maybe married seven times to six women or something like that, uh, or, may, or was it eight times to seven women? Anyway, a lot. Uh, so what's going on here? <clears throat> We're looking for our moon and Mars influences. Here's moon and Mars in the first house. Uh, and of course, from there, they, they aspect the, uh, the seventh as well. Um, the Karaka Venus is there, influenced by moon, influenced by Mars. <clears throat> um, the seventh Lord Mercury, uh, although it's in a Trikishtana, it's in the sign of Mars. So <clears throat> all of this is additive. No single factor will say, aha, but, you know, a multitude of factors will, you know, basically each time we do one of these little tests, you know, his first and seventh Lord in this that situation, Moon, Mars, Venus, whatever, we're looking for a little twitch of the needle this way or that way or this way or that way. But when it keeps deflecting this way, then you know, we get certainly confidence that that's the way it's going to go. I think I have just enough time to whip through the mixed marriage sort of notion, which is, you know, a, a term uh, that people will apply to those who marry out of caste uh, or, you know, get attached to somebody who is a different ethnicity, language, religion, etc. You know, in Western society, you know, uh, you know, tolerates this or, or condones it. Uh, but when, you know, um, you know, I could fall in love with somebody of a different ethnicity uh, and society says that's OK. But when I bring them home to my parents, well, you know, there may be some issue, uh, not specifically with my parents, but, you know, some people's parents may have that. So uh, mixed marriage is this notion of what happens when there's this differentness. You know, we're invoking strangers or foreigners. So first, the person has to have these signatures of Moon and Mars, you know, the spontaneity, the emotional connection and Mars, the courage to sort of break out of uh, the status quo. And now to invoke the notion of a stranger or a foreigner, somebody that we sort of imply, you know, out of caste, uh, different religion, language, ethnicity, we're going to need to see the presence of Saturn or Rahu especially Rahu. And that's sort of a given, you know, we're all familiar with that. Saturn and Rahu represent strangers. So we're going to look for links to the first house or its Lord uh, in Saturn's sign. Well, Rahu has no signs, but we can look for links to the planet itself. But again, I stress that first we need a foundation with uh, the moon or Mars influences. And we, we look at that perspective from the first house and we look at it from the seventh house. And I won't linger over this because the principle is the same. And finally, we do the very same with Venus, looking at its links with uh, Saturn and, and or um, Rahu. Um, let me skip over David Bowie and uh, go directly to Priyanka Chopra, who, who needs no introduction, of course. Uh, and see what we have in her horoscope. Uh, you know, as all of you would know, she married an American guy, uh, Nick Jonas, um, who was an American pop singer. And so what do we see in her horoscope that, you know, reflects this? Well, 
Moon is exalted in the first house. So there's some notion of romanticism. This is a powerful moon, uh, somewhat of a mixed condition moon, we might say. It's a bit uh, on the dark side waning, but uh, exalted nonetheless and in the ascendant. So that's one factor. But then let's look at Lagnesh is Venus. And where is Venus? Here's Venus on the Rahu K2 axis. So there's some inclination for, you know, some attraction to uh, uh, people of uh, some foreign disposition. If we go to the seventh Lord, we get Mars. Uh, and where's Mars? Uh, Mars is with Saturn. Uh, and that is indicative of the foreigner as well, too. Now, in this case, Venus has played double duty as Lagnesh and also as Karaka. So again, there's no single influence to this, but um, it, it adds up. Let me go back to David Bowie, who perhaps needs no introduction either, famous, you know, rock star. Uh, married first to a, an English woman, later to a black woman, the Somali model imam. And after that, he received a terrific amount of hate mail <clears throat> from his fans who were obviously racist and uh, denigrated him for that, for that uh, marriage. So have a look at his horoscope. Um, Capricorn is his ascendant. So Saturn is his Lord. And lo and behold, it has gone to the seventh house. It's with the moon, which is the seventh Lord. So we sort of get that romantic impulse. That's one thing right there. Um, uh, Saturn alone in the seventh house is, you know, some indication of the potential foreigner. Or the seventh Lord moon with Saturn also does it. Uh, and then Karaka. Uh, Venus uh, is in a Mars sign and it's on the Rahu K2 axis, which again invokes this notion of foreign uh, bonds. Uh, last horoscope, and this will be the end of the presentation, just barely in time. Um, George Clooney, a famous movie star, voted so many times Hollywood's most handsome man or something like that, was a bachelor for a long, 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 long while until he married, oh gosh, I've forgotten her last name, Amal. She was a Lebanese lawyer, is, was, is, was Lebanese, and was a, a, an activist lawyer. Uh, so there was a great sigh of despair throughout Hollywood when all the, you know, Hollywood starlets said, uh, he's gone, I, we can't have him now, uh, he's married Amal. Uh, so what do we see, you know, in his horoscope? Well, for starters, he's got Rahu Ketu running through the first and seventh house. Um, you know, in my experience, we'll often see this turn up in the charts of people who form a relationship with someone sort of who is outside the normal orbit of, uh, you know, social contacts for them. And some inclination uh, and likelihood for interaction with people of, you know, a so-called quote-unquote foreign disposition. Uh, more, you know, um, pointedly, though, let's have a look where uh, the Ascendant Lord Saturn is. Uh, so Saturn is in its own sign, Swarashi in Capricorn. Notice it's with the moon. There's that thing that gives, you know, emotionality, uh, emotional contact, spontaneity. Uh, Saturn is in mutual uh, aspect with Mars, and therefore so is the moon. So this is Chandra Mangala all over again. Um, and uh, that, that kind of high spirit and high energy. And it's also, um, you know, a significator of passion as well, too. We won't get into this today, but it's in, it's in my book, you know, uh, the, the analysis of sexuality. Uh, Moon, Mars aspects are high on the bill and all that. Uh, so Saturn, mutual aspect with uh, Mars, which is in a moon sign. So the strong sambanda there with Moon and Mars because they're in mutual aspect and the Moon disposits Mars. Mars, of course, aspects back into the Ascendant uh, by virtue of its special aspect. And uh, the seventh Lord, uh, seventh uh, house is Leo. Uh, the Sun, uh, the seventh Lord, is in a sign of Mars. And last but not least, Venus as a Karaka is aspected by Saturn. So we get these influences uh, on the first Lord, on the seventh Lord, uh, Saturn, Rahu, multiple times throughout these horoscope, which, you know, illustrates, again, you know, a single indicator does not make the case, but multiple indicators can and do uh, make that case. Okay, so I'm back to uh, this uh, 
slide and I'll let this linger a moment. Um, uh, Mutu, I've uh, I've gone through my presentation. Uh, I don't know whether you wish to conclude at this point or allow time for questions. It's your call. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, Alan has given only a glimpse of what he have wrote in his book. Uh, the book is more elaborate uh, than what he presented. <clears throat> so if someone wants to uh, learn more about this, uh, definitely you should check his book. Alan, I think your book is available on Amazon, right? Yes, uh, all my books are on Amazon, it's true. Sure, sure. So I will provide the link uh, when I send the video, recorded video, I will send the link of his book. So now we'll open up for the Q&A. Uh, like if anybody have any questions, like we'll take up uh, some 10, 15 minutes, we'll take. Very good. <clears throat> I apologize for going through that so quickly. I, I know I became a bit of a motor mouse, uh, but if you record it, this will, if you have recorded it, and I believe you have, it'll, it'll allow people to uh, review it again and, and digest some of this. Definitely, yes. Sandhanam, uh, Ram, Ram, uh, you have any questions? Like you typed some of the comments in the, um, the chat window. Oh, I see. There's a whole lot of questions. So I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Um, uh, okay. Are there any? Okay, so I see somebody yeah. asked. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm outside. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I asked, like, if the Lagnesh has to have a link with uh, the Seventh Lord, or is it okay if the Seventh Lord is also, or uh, Lagnesh or Seventh Lord has a Kendra or a Trikona connection as well? Uh, I'm not not clear on the question. You're asking whether Lagnesh and Seventh Lord, uh, what kind of relationship? Yeah, if they are in a kendra, like in a square or in an angle. Oh uh, no! Basically, the the significance in this level of analysis, basically graha vichara, we're looking at the condition of the grahas and their interrelationship with each other. Uh, being in mutual kendras is not going to be uh, helpful uh, unless there's a mutual mm -hmm. aspect there as well. So we're looking for as association or aspects rather than being in mutual traconas or mutual kendras to each other, if that's your question. Yeah, yeah, got it, yeah. Uh, and my other question was that uh, in case of Priyanka Chopra's case, uh, the seventh Lord Mars was is with Saturn, and the uh, Venus is with Mercury in Mercury's own sign, though the degree is a uh, little bit far away. Uh, so, will it not does it not also add up to some kind of disclin disinclination by the same logic, the influence of Mercury and Saturn? Yes, and. Yes, and you will often, it's rare that you will find a horoscope that is 100% pure, you know, purely inclined yeah. versus purely disinclined. Uh, what you have yeah. to do is simply go through the process and enumerate yeah. what you found on either side and then, you know, judge the, uh, the condition, the avastas of the grahas involved and especially where Sambanda is significant, those are gonna be the factors that are gonna rise above as being more significant versus some other that is less significant by virtue of Avasta or lack of uh, powerful Sambanda. So you know, all things are not created equal. You could have you know, five factors on either side uh, arguing, you know, out of both sides of your mouth, as, as it were. But if you examine them more closely, you will usually find strength in some and sort of, you know, lackluster, you know, capacity in others. And that will, you know, basically tip the scale enough for you to make a, a commitment on, on the judgment. I mean, as we all know, it's tricky. How many times have we grappled with horoscopes over whatever, you know, will my child be a boy or a girl? You know, this, that, and the other thing, you know, uh, we're, we're coping with this constantly. Somebody, uh, I saw something just pop up in the uh, in the chat here said, what about same-sex relationships? Well, same-sex relationships would fall into that same heading as uh, marriage outside the norm. It's sort of like, you know, marriage to a foreigner, and it certainly goes against 
uh, the grain uh, for many families, even though in Western society, let's say, take my own society as an example, where, you know, um, same-sex uh, marriage is now recognized as being legal. Uh, does that mean everybody's family, you know, condones it or approves it or whatever? Certainly not so. Uh, so for same-sex relationship, you're going to see the same signatures as you would see in some of those last examples, example charts with uh, Bowie, Clooney, and Chopra, okay. where you've got this notion okay. of foreignness, especially with uh, Rahu Ketu involved. Uh, I saw another pop-up that said something about, what about divorce? But you see, now we're getting into a different topic. As opposed to the inclination for a relationship or not, or whether you will pursue a so-called foreign relationship or not, now you're talking, that's a bias. Those are biases. What happens divorce is an outcome of relationship. And that's a different matter. That's a seventh house analysis, which, as I say, there's no time to sort of dive into that today. Um, I wish I knew how to access your um, uh, the chat comments. I can see the participants. And uh, oh, okay, so here now I see them. Uh, let me just plow through this. Yeah, uh, one more question from Swati Sharma. So yes. She asked, could you please let us know if you have, uh, have any comments on combust Venus? What does the person incline? <laughs> Okay, so, you know, the general rule for uh, all combust gurahas is that uh, combustion may harm the uh, outward aspects of the, that which Venus or, or the combust planet rules, uh, but not necessarily the inner qualities. So uh, I have a totally combust Venus, and yet it does not deny me artistic uh, impulse aesthetic sensibility, romantic inclinations. However, it may affect negatively uh, the matters ruled by house, according to Venus. So uh, with respect to the individual, a combust Venus will not destroy their romantic instincts, but a combust Venus, if that Venus is lord of their seventh house, Ah, that's an external quality, you know, despite how much love they might have for their spouse, uh, the marriage is a social institution. And if Venus is the Lord of the Seventh and combust, that could be a bad sign for the marriage. But so it's true, if Venus was the Lord of the Tenth, it might be, you know, bad for the career. But your question is basically, you know, in the context of romance, and I understand that. Uh, somebody says, if the seventh lord is Saturn and it has aspect on Venus and Moon, what does that signify? Well, if Saturn is the seventh lord, uh, it's part of the process for the analysis of romanticism. And if that Saturn, the seventh lord, is influenced by Moon and Venus, it means something of a romantic disposition on the part of the partner. Let's face it, if you have uh, Gemini rising, Virgo rising, Capricorn rising, or, or Aquarius rising, you are not doomed to being single simply because those are sort of, you know, non-romantic grahas. Uh, your, your Saturn lord of your Capricorn or um, uh, Aquarian ascendant could be in its own sign. It could be in Libra. It could be in the seventh house, all of which will create uh, some inclination to bond. So uh, we have to follow that protocol and look first at the planet, um, you know, the ascendant uh, or its lord as being a recipient of influence from other planets, which are either romantically inclined or disinclined. And that will sort of help to keep you straight. I think I went through everything in the chat here that was uh, uh, that I hadn't heard verbally. Is there anything else? I think there is one question from Nikhil. He is asking about Nakshatra. Seventh Lord Saturn in Venus Nakshatra and Venus in the Saturn's Nakshatra. Is there any implications? For the most part, you know, we don't need to get into uh, that level of analysis because, you know, um, you should be able to, no, you should be able to get it sorted out on the level of planets, disposition, their avastas, you know, in the normal spectrum of things, whether planets are 
weak or strong by by virtue of exaltation, debilitation, swarashi, combustion versus the you know um, um, digbala or retrogression or planetary war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, only if you get into a deadlock at the very end of your analysis and can't seem to see your way forward then I would go into nakshatras. But this is something I did not even attempt to broach in the context of my book, because once you get into that level of detail, you know, it can get, you know, too detailed. And then, you know, the book is already long enough as it is. Um, so I would de defer that to, you know, get tackle it if you feel you need to it. But there's, you know, other ways to look at When I get into a deadlock, personally, looking at a chart from the perspective of the Lugna, and I get into, uh, you know, hung up where I can't decide which way this is going to go, my recourse to resolution, rotate the chart to Chandra Lugna, do that analysis all over again. And that usually deals with any roadblocks. I urge you know people to do this. Uh, you know, go to Chandra Lagna whenever you get deadlocked, and no matter what the question is, whether it's about relationship, will I have children, what's my career going to look like, when we get stuck from the point of view of Udaya Lagna, go to Chandra Lagna. I almost never do it, but if I had to, I'm ready to go to Surya Lagna. Do those things first before you before you need to get into the chakras. My advice. Keep it simple. Thank you. Hi, Ashwin. Thanks for joining. Hello, Thank you. Back. Thank you all. Hello, Let me just end with one with our uh, final mantra in recognition of the study. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasyasyate Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Muti and um, Ashwin, thank you both very much. I'm very much in your debt and very grateful for your combined efforts in making this happen. Thank you, guys. We can do this again sometime if you like. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, thank you, but I'm sorry I joined a little late because my earlier meeting got extended. But uh, sure, uh, Alan's presentation is not new to me. So, um, so to talk about Alan, I think I've known Alan's work for the past five or six years, and uh, yeah. Alan always, you know, takes up those obvious topics that no one really cares to research about. So, Alan has done so much work on Parivartana Yoga. And uh, he has also done some incredible work on Viparit Raja Yoga. So these things are like, we just take things for granted because it's there for the taking, but very few people get into the depth of it. So I think, thank you so much, Alan, for, for your commendable contributions over the years. Thank you, Ashwin. Again, I just put it back up to where it belongs. I thank my teacher, Hart Defoe, and his guru, now deceased, Mantraji. God bless them both. Thank you, boy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.